evening and welcome to our last city council meeting for July and then we go on a summer break here uh, in these chambers. Would you please uh, join us in the Pledge of Allegiance and this evening we will be led by Relay for Life. Go ahead. The flag is behind you. There we go. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much. All right, Madam Clerk, would you please do the roll call? Councilmember Engler. Councilmember Engler. Sorry. Yes, just Roll say call. yes. 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 <laughs> Councilmember McNamee. Yes. Councilmember Adam. Here. And Mayor Bill Pena. Present. And uh, Councilmember Jones is absent. Thank you so much. We don't have any uh, continuance of any public hearing or agenda item. So this will take us straight to item number five, which is special presentations. And for that, I'm going to move to the podium for the first time in over 15 months. All right. Okay, so for our first presentation, I am very pleased this evening to have an opportunity to talk to our incredible park district here, CRPD. Where are you? Here you are, all of you, right here. <laughs> so please come on to the podium. So anyone who lives in Thousand Oaks knows the Conejo Recreation and Park District and that it is an integral part of our city. Their parks and recreation programs help establish and maintain our quality of life, which our new Los Robles interns are about to experience, those who are new to the community, ensure the health of our residents, and contribute to our economic and environmental well-being. And during this past year, CRPD provided a vital respite from the stress of the pandemic. We have tremendous appreciation for all that CRPD board and staff do to allow us to have world-class parks and recreation programs for our residents. It is therefore my honor on behalf of the entire city council to proclaim July as Parks and Recreation Month. And here is... <laughs> here we go, this is it. And Chair Doug Nichols, you are going to make some remarks, yes? yes Congratulations, there yes, we go. Thank you, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. This is wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, Madam Mayor. It's a privilege to be here this evening. Uh, and yes, I, I mean, July is a great month for recognizing parks and recreation. Uh, and especially after we've gone through a rather challenging 15 months, and where parks have been found to be quite essential in our daily life. And what we found is just that, uh, how, how people have not only rallied around the parks, but realized how, uh, how essential just meeting together is, and the parks were a place to do that. But the theme for this month, for this, uh, through the National Park and Recreation Association, is our park re and recreation story. And I thought, well, our story is a partnership because we've enjoyed such a wonderful partnership with the city. And that started in 1964. And we've been doing things together for a long time. In fact, I was looking at the number of facilities we have, and you'd be hard pressed to find a facility that doesn't say something like, funded by the city of Thousand Oaks and operated by the Canal Recreation and Park District. Because the, the city has been so integral in the funding of these recreational facilities. So, while we get to be the caretakers, so much of what we've done has been a partnership with the city. We've had a lot of major partnerships over the years with the facilities that we've had, but I just wanted to focus on a couple of the present projects that we've had. Recently, 
The city budgeted $1.5 million as a grant to the Canal Recreation and Park District mm -hmm. for the construction, <laughs> yes, for the construction of the Canal Creek Southwest Park, uh, which is gonna be a neighborhood park, which will facilitate, uh, you know, particularly some of the recreation for those on the west end of Thousand Oaks Boulevard, but uh, all the neighbors are going to be enjoying that. Then also the Park District and the city came together to, with agreement on the Rancho Betrayal Community Equestrian Center and the Thousand Oaks Library property, where we were able to kind of swap arrangements a little bit and so who was managing what to keep things in better alignment with our charges as, as different agencies. Uh, also part of that will be continuing to work on the Costca Olympia farm site and, uh, uh, and kind of enhance that to what it was originally designed to be. Then also we have our teen center, Alex Fiore Teen Center, and also the Goebel Adult Community Center, which we've had partnerships with them for a long time, but recently the, those agreements have been extended, so we'll have those facilities available and operating for many years to come. But also, again, the city has assisted in funding for the improvement of the uh, adult center and also adding a backyard to the teen center, which I know our teens are quite excited to have. And then uh, this morning we had a ceremony at the Healing Garden, which was also a recent addition to our facility at the Canal Creek Park North, um, in which again, the city provided funding for that. So thank you for those partnerships. And then uh, recently I just learned that uh, the, through the Thousand Oaks Theater Director, Jonathan Surrett, that he has created a way for the Young Artists Ensemble to return back to the Bank of America Performing Arts Center, which is gonna be a great, Opportunity. In fact, I brought some flyers. Uh, Jim Jim, Gre Jim uh, Friedel brought those along. Should I'll have those for the uh, team summer musical? That's going to be an exciting performance this year. And then, so as I think about parks and recreation, yes, it is parks and recreation. But our partnerships have created things like healing places for celebrating, performing. I know favorite to our mayor, uh, and also so social and essential services. We partner in many ways to make our community what it is today. So I just want to thank you for this recognition. Yes, it is a recognition of uh, what, the, what the Park District provides to our community, but we share constituencies and we share uh, a real desire to serve them jointly. We thank you for that partnership and thank you for this recognition. We will certainly appreciate that. So thank you so much. I just also want to mention, We do have our entire board with us tonight, uh, Vice Chair Nellie Cusworth, we have Chuck Huffer, George Lang, uh, Susan Holt, and then with our General Manager, Jim Friedel. Uh, I would have to say that while we perhaps get to stand up here with some accolades, it's really Jim and his staff that make this organization work, and particularly the staff. Uh, this, this last 15 months has been great, and I see Rochelle hiding up in the right. attic Rochelle up there, there. Rochelle <laughs> Callis, who, who has her, her Least, less favorite term this year has been pivot. <laughs> and they have pivoted incessantly. So again, Rochelle, thank you and your team and thank you all for the, for the recognition. Thank you so much. And for the interns here tonight, the Healing Garden is a reflection area to remember the uh, 12 victims who died in the borderline bar and grill shooting three, um, not quite three years ago, two and a half years ago, for those who are new to the community. All right. And next, I would like to welcome Dr. Jasper Tacker. Where are you? Oh, there you are. Very good. Dr. Tacker is the director of the GME residence program at Los Robles Regional Medical Center. And so you're here tonight to present the very first interns in internal medicine to, Los, to the city at Los Robles Hospital. This has been, it's been a program many years in the making and everybody in a white coat here represents the very first class of interns at Los Robles. And they're here tonight to receive a certificate of recognition 
This time it'll have your name spelled correctly, I think. There were a few problems last time. But um, we really wanted to present, to give Los Robles Hospital an opportunity to present these, this first class to the city council and to the rest of the city, 127,000 people. So um, Dr. Tacker, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, so we're very excited to finally have the residents join Los Robles and really make this a teaching hospital. I think when you bring graduate medical education to a community, there's many benefits for the community. Um, and first and foremost, probably the most important is you're training these residents and hopefully retaining the residents within our community. So really, when we were recruiting, we were trying to pick the residents that had ties to Thousand Oaks and the Conejo Valley. And I think a majority of our residents do that. So as the uh, population of physicians is aging, there's gonna be a huge shortage of physicians and hopefully we can help fill that. I think in addition, you know, the opportunity to really serve in the community is gonna be huge for them, whether it's through community outreach, um, mentoring young children, working with our senior citizens, or reaching those, uh, you know, living in underserved areas within Ventura County. All are great opportunities for our residents to really get involved in the community. And um, also, it helps recruit uh, you know, quality physicians to the hospital as well, because they want to teach and they want to be a part of the program. So that helps build the overall care of the program. So with that being said, I want to introduce a few members of my team here. Uh, we have our Chief Medical Officer of Los Robles, Dr. Gabriela Sherman. We have our Associate Program Director, Dr. Ariane Gower. We have our administrative director, Denise Bell, and of course, our very important link to the community, Amy Commons. And I think Dr. Sherman wants to say a few words. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Tacker. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you to all of our um, wonderful uh, constituents here this evening. On behalf of the hospital, I just want to thank you for your partnership in helping us bring graduate medical education here to Los Robles. As Dr. Tacker shared, I'm the Chief Medical Officer at Los Robles Health System, so I oversee all things related to quality of care at the facility. And I have no doubt that the level of care will only continue to improve with the years to come with bringing graduate medical education here to our community. I think it will attract a lot of talented physicians uh, who want to practice here, who want to participate in clinical research, in new procedures, and bringing new technology into the Conejo Valley. So I think that uh, uh, adding our residency program will undoubtedly raise the level of care and just bring a great uh, atmosphere to uh, the Los Robles Regional Medical Center and an academic feel to our medical center that has been a long time coming. So once again, I'd like to thank you for your partnership. As uh, many have said, it's been a long time coming here to the facility, and it takes uh, many people to make this program a success. So I'd like to thank all of you and thank the members of our leadership team who are here this evening. Um, new entrants, as I call your name, um, in some alphabetical order that you're already in, uh, come on down and receive your certificate. Uh, Dr. Amir Ahmed. Dr. Sobia Ashfak. Dr. Saro Avedikian. Congratulations. Dr. Setrak Az Azren Kassian. <laughs> Dr. Nikul Chopra. Dr. Joseph Detweiler. Dr. Julie Ferris. Dr. Neil Gertz. Dr. Safkias.
Dr. Farhad Hashmi. Dr. Jake Kim. Dr. Brian Lamb. Give me an extra second. Dr. Ryan Meesen. Dr. Prasad Nadendla. Dr. Azam Nassim. Dr. Kevin Nguyen. Dr. Trevor Owens. Dr. Yasmin Tahiri. Dr. Atusa Salehani. And Dr. Justin Sun. Thank you. We will try to take a picture in front of the dais with the rest of the council members, yes? All right, we are now going to continue with public comments. Madam Clerk. This is the time and place for public comments for those wishing to address the City Council regarding items on the agenda or on a subject within the City's jurisdiction. All remarks should be addressed to the Council as a whole. Speakers are requested to state their name and community of residence for the record. Under state law, public comment matters may not be considered by the Council unless listed on the agenda, but may be referred to the City Manager for administrative follow-up. Eight individuals have requested to speak and pursuant to council standards, speakers are allowed three minutes. Thank you. Our first speaker is joining us via, via video, Faith Grant, followed by our cultural affairs director, Jonathan Surrett, who is here in person. Good evening. I'm a member of the Caneo Climate Coalition and I wanna give a big shout out to the Agoura Hills City Council who voted three to two on June 23rd 
to approve ordinances managing electrification of all new residential and commercial construction. All new buildings in Agoura Hills will soon be all electric, the latest city to take this major step to meet climate goals and protect residents. The vote reflects a change to the city's climate action and adaptation plan. 42 cities across California have already adopted bans or severe restrictions on fossil gas connections in new construction. The Agora Hills approval must be seen as reinforcing both the accelerating statewide trend, as well as the urgent need to transition quickly away from polluting and dangerous fossil fuel connections to safer, healthier, more affordable living choices for residents and workers of all new building development. The Caneo Climate Coalition has been speaking at Thousand Oaks City Council and Planning Commission meetings for the past six months, advocating for mandatory building electrification reach codes in all new residential and commercial development. Our city's greenhouse gas emissions from burning fossil gas in buildings are second only to those coming from the transportation sector and are a major contributor to the climate crisis, which is already directly threatening our community in the form of prolonged drought, extreme heat, potential water scarcity, and more frequent intensifying wildfires. We are asking the city council to join Agora Hills and other leading California cities and approve mandatory building electrification for Thousand Oaks this year. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Jonathan Surrett, followed by Christy Warner. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of council. Uh, it, it gives me a lot of pride to be able to come up here tonight to thank you uh, for the leadership that you have in investing in the arts in our community. I don't get a lot of opportunity to come before you to thank you for all of the events that we do throughout the year, because in normal years, they are a lot. Uh, but this past June, we were able to put on our third annual pop-up arts and music festival. If TOTV could show the, the slide from the overhead projector. Our pop-up arts and music festival is a big investment in our community for arts and culture. It gives people a safe way to be outside of their houses in different areas around the Conejo to experience different types of events. And this year, is it right side up? Good. Uh, this year, we were fortunate enough to showcase seven different events in seven different locations all around the community. The idea is that we take events outside of the theaters and we put them out in the city for free for the community to come out and enjoy. And we couldn't do it without our partnership with Conejo Recreation and Park District, certainly without support from TO Arts and without uh, the leadership from you all in uh, allowing us to keep that event moving forward on a yearly basis. So on behalf of the Cultural Affairs Department and the community, I'd like to offer our gratitude. All of the events were very well attended. We had an average of about 300 attendees at every single event, which is huge. It's, it gave us an opportunity to showcase local performers, including our resident companies and the Caneo Valley Youth Orchestra, and then also bring in uh, professional performers from outside the area to add to the arts and culture exposure in the community, so thank you. Thank you, yes. The pop-up series is fantastic. Can't wait until next year. Uh, next, we have Christy Warner, and she's here with her entourage to announce the uh, Relay for Life. Come on up, guys. Come on up. Good evening, Madam Mayor, council members, and viewing audience. My name is Christy Warner. I am a proud Kiwanian. I'm a teacher, I'm the advisor to the Westlake High School Key Club and the K-Kids Service Leadership Program. But I'm also a Caneo Valley Relay for Life volunteer and I brought some youth members of our executive leadership team to share some exciting news. All right, you're up. Hi, um, sorry. Um, hello, my name is Aaliyah. <laughs> Hello, my name is Aaliyah Connor. We are excited to announce that on, ex on September 18th, 2021, from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m., at Caneo Creek, North Caneo Valley, will come 
will come together again to promise to for, one to for one purpose to fight cancer fight cancer join us to fight this disease, to, to, disease. please go to our website relayforlife.org slash Caneo Valley CA and sign up today so we can send cancer on a permanent vacation. That's right. All right, next up. Hurry. Hello, my name is Emily Katz. Cancer has touched the lives of millions of people each year, impacting our friends and loved ones. It's likely that we've all know someone or has faced that, has uh, that who has faced or is currently facing cancer thank you all right hello i am danica gonzalez from the westlake high school key club the american cancer society relay for life event is a life-changing one that gives everyone in our community and those across the world a chance to celebrate the lives of people who have battled cancer remember those we have lost and for fighting back against this disease the American Cancer Society is the largest private source of cancer research funding in the United States. The funds raised through Relay for Life will help find better treatments and lead scientists closer to a cure, as well as provide many educational support and early detection programs and services to our community. Funds from Relay for Life have helped the American Cancer Society provide lodging for family members whose loved ones are undergoing treatment and provide almost half a million rides to and from treatment facilities. The funds have also helped fulfill almost a million requests for cancer information. Thank you. Good job. All right, you. Join us as we celebrate survivors, raise funds, and make new friends. Together with your help, we can make a difference. Five, four, four three, three two. two. We can make a difference, and so can you. you. Join our team or start one, too. City, City of Thousand Oaks, Oaks, we really need you. Yay. Excellent. Thank you. We have pens and flyers. Go ahead. Very good. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Alan Garrett here in person, followed by Sean Moradian here in person, and then Kathy Carlson, also in person. Hello, uh, thank you, Madam Mayor and council members. Um, I'm here as a resident of Thousand Oaks. I live in the Greenwich Village tract, the older part of Thousand Oaks. My husband and I have owned our home for uh, since 1999. Um, the reason why I'm here is Council Member McNamee was kind enough to suggest that those um, residents of Thousand Oaks who have had issues with the building and planning department at the city perhaps present their case at this hearing. Um, my background is I'm actually a licensed architect, and for the past 14 years, I've been a professional construction manager. So I certainly have a background in building and construction and working with many building departments. Uh, my husband and I applied for a permit for a 400 square foot addition to our detached garage on January 7th of this year. And it took us until last week to obtain a permit. Um, that's six months. Uh, that's an extraordinary amount of time for a very, very minor project. Um, unfortunately, much of it was being blamed on the difficulties of functioning during COVID. Uh, it has been challenging to function during COVID, certainly. But the issues that we encountered really were not COVID-19 issues. They were issues having to do with communication within the departments and between the departments and follow, follow through. I, I, I've actually documented our experience with a timeline and I, including many, many, but not all of the occasions where I called uh, planners or building department uh, plan checkers and officials and received no return, no response. 
Um, I also, in an effort to try to expedite this, contacted uh, the heads of planning and building. And I have to say I was very disappointed in the response. Um, I will mention that the city manager's office has an employee named Rocky who was uh, superb. She was uh, very responsive and very helpful, and I thank you for that. Uh, but I think that if, if we're experiencing this and we're professionals in the construction business, uh, then certainly many other people are experiencing it. And uh, I also witnessed many contractors who were in line once the building department opened again, and they were furious because they were not able to obtain permits for very simple things, and their livelihoods were, were at risk because of that. Things like plastering a pool, putting up a retaining wall. It was taking them three to five months to get permits for that. So um, I did want to bring it to your attention. I am going to follow up with the city manager's office to provide all the documentation. And thank you for listening. Thank you very much. We'll make sure that somebody will contact you very soon. Uh, our next speaker is Sean Moradian, followed by Kathy Carlson and then Sharon Moret. Good evening. Good evening, Madam Mayor. Where are those documents distributed? I had a few exhibits, so perhaps I can um, let this next speaker speak, and then I'll come back once those exhibits are in your hands. The next speaker is Kathy Carlson, followed by Sharon Moret. Oh, actually followed by Mr. Moradian then. Thank you. Where's the timer now? Good evening, everyone. I'm Kathy Carlson. Uh, I, in case you missed my letter to the editor five days ago, um, I wrote about the Borchard parcel, and uh, a few of the sentences were left out, so I'm here to read it to you tonight in its entirety. There has been much too much drama over the word wetlands in describing the empty Borchard parcel next to the 101. What is the truth? I found the definition in a 2006 pamphlet from the Ventura County Planning Commission entitled Guide to Ventura County Wetlands. I called to see if the three elements of the definition were still valid. They referred me to two of the state agencies listed in the pamphlet that use these elements to confer this status. The Army Corps of Engineers still requires all three elements to be in place. Fish and wildlife still only have to have one of the three elements. Um, uh, but the Army Corps of Engineers needs all three elements to be in place, and then Fish and Wildlife only needs one uh, to declare it a wetlands. But the public has every right to use the simple colloquial meaning, a place that gets flooded. Both officers of those agencies informed me that in the past the parcel has been declared each... Um, by each as a wetlands. Furthermore, both officers stated independently to me that it is indeed a colloquial, temporary, and seasonal wetlands today. They also emphasized that they cannot go on the property to determine the soil samples and flora samples without the permission of the owner. They both also told me that the public should know that such a status does not prohibit development. However, the determination by state agencies is required by the City of Thousand Oaks in order to fully inform a potential buyer of the risks. Such scientific reports will also inform the interested parties whether or not it could be very, very costly to drain this area. Not impossible, just costly. A wetlands, colloquial or legally defined, is not suitable for low-income housing because the developer would find it a huge challenge to recoup the costs of development with below market rate rent. This is simply a bad business plan and a very bad return on investment risk. Just ask the present owners of the soggy white elephant property, the old continuation school, four blocks away on Kelly Road. Various owners and investors have had nightmares for darn close to 10 years trying to unlock Load it. How many buyers have we seen backing out of that deal because of the same water problems in addition to the proximity of an earthquake fault? Any three-year-old can tell you that water drains down in a bathtub. The Caneo Valley is, a nar is narrow and steep. Ask that same three-year-old whether or not water is going to collect downhill at the bottom of a valley. 
Please back off on attacking your neighbors over this definition issue. It is both reckless and careless of politicians and social media influencers on Facebook to scream out their cries that other parties are idiots while insisting that this land is, was, never was, can't be, or always has been a wetlands. Nature is changeable. So is the status of a legally declared or a colloquially named wetlands. Thank you. Next we have, um I see uh, the computer says um, Sharon Moret. <clears throat> Can we change the name? Okay, very good. Go ahead, Ms. Moradian. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Sean Moradian, Honorable City Council members. I am a native to Thousand Oaks and a lifelong resident, and I'm here before you to bring a continuation of the general plan uh, and something that we discovered through public records to your attention that are deeply concerning to my family and I, and I believe uh, the public and this council deserves to know the truth and the whole truth. And I'd like to start out with our mission statement. City of Thousand Oaks prides itself on extraordinary service to the citizens we serve is our purpose. Okay. The exhibits in front of you are going to outline everything I'm gonna describe in a chronology of what took place leading up to the May 18th, 2021 letter from the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy to the City of Thousand Oaks. During the May 18th City Council meeting and the subsequent May 25th City Council meeting, one of the council members brought this letter up and the irregularities around the county supervisor attempting to inflict their personal opinions into a local jurisdictional land use decision to comply with state housing laws. Ultimately, the property um, and the general plan were moved forward. Subsequently, on June 8th, a city council member took it upon themselves to reprimand that other council member for their comments and their attacks on a sitting supervisor, and I like to quote, just because it's relevant here. We do not use the dais to attack elected officials from our partner agencies. What we say and write on social media carries a lot of weight, and if that power is abused to spread misinformation, I have to say something about it. Stick to the norms and civility. So here we go. May 18th, there was a letter sent to the City of Thousand Oaks from the Conservancy. No one's taken responsibility for who authorized this letter, who ordered it, where it came from. It was never agendized. On May 16th, County Supervisor Linda Parks posted on her public Facebook page that the Conservancy wants to acquire this piece of land. Moving back to May 4th, Linda Parks writes to the Conservancy stating, we should write a letter and get involved in the general plan discussion, which she has adamantly denied. What really should be concerning to this body and everybody listening is what transpires next. These are their words that I'm gonna read for you. Since Moradian has shifted the tide, he is still an unlikely willing seller at fair market value. He needs to suffer more to get to that point. One more time, you have a deputy director of a, of a state agency saying to a county supervisor that a private citizen needs to suffer more in order to buy their property at below fair market value. It gets worse. I hope at all level the county holds firm, meaning Supervisor Pox block this. Fine if T.O. can benefit from, from go SAG units so long as they are never built. Undermining and sabotaging our city's general plan. What body and what action do you think, Mrs. Parks, would be appropriate to write a letter? Next, our supervisor does not say- Mr. Moradi, in your time is up. I need to finish this, with all due respect. With I all due respect, this. everybody needs the same amount of time. Perhaps there's a council member who would like to ask you questions, so this can drag uh, on further. I can I'd like to hear- yeah. the, I would too. The, I'd like to hear the end of it, if that's okay, Mayor. I have just okay. one more minute. Thank you so much. One more minute, very Thank good. Thank you. Our county supervisor does not condemn these words. She wholeheartedly embraces them and says, great, you should write the letter to the city of Thousand Oaks on the general plan. They're gonna be making a decision on May 18th and on May 25th. And that's exactly what they did. And then, remember she posted on Facebook on May 16th that we have a willing seller. Before any other body was able to see a draft of this letter, she received the draft that morning asking who 
and what and in what manner should we steer it on the 17th? She replied and gave precise instructions. Pursuant to my Public Records Request Act, nobody from the Conservancy has any records whatsoever of authorizing this letter. Nobody from the Board of Supervisors has any knowledge. So what I'm presenting before this council and I'm urging action is that you have a county supervisor making a backroom deal with a state agency to inflict suffering on one of your citizens to steal their family land. Now, my request is as follows. Please pass a resolution strongly condemning Supervisor Parks and the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy's actions for this intentional interference in our city's general plan update, its effort to comply with state housing laws, and their assault on a private citizen. Further, the city appoints a representative to the Santa Monica Mountain Conservancy Board to raise the same issue and ask that board to strongly condemn backdoor deals struck between Supervisor Parks, Deputy Director Edelman, without any board notice, authorization, resolution, or public disclosure. This is not what being a resident of Thousand Oaks should feel like. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moradian. Next up, we have Sharon Moret, followed by Andy Levine. You can use that microphone if you like. Oh, I see. Good evening to the council members, staff, and residents of Thousand Oaks. There is a problem with rebuilding the city for 50% more housing units than originally planned for. There is an edict from the state that unless we do so, we risk loss of funding by the state. We can roll over and play dead and submit to the state, which seems to be what our city council is doing, or we can challenge the state. The state is not always right. And in fact, the Supreme Court ruled against California. Our taxes may have to pay for lawsuits by small businesses and religious institutions, which were forced to close down during the pandemic while stupidly allowing wine stores and cannabis stores to remain open as essential businesses. It is interesting to note that our governor may own a winery. Here are examples of what is being done now to combat the state's edict and the results of unplanned growth. We are paying high taxes and need to protect Thousand Oaks. We need to proceed slowly and cautiously, but not ignore what residents expect of our city leaders. There is always a need to alter our city, plan, our city general plan, but not to the extent that the state is requiring us to do. An article in the Orange County Register dated June 29th states that Orange County cities have bandied together to sue the state regarding the unprecedented amount of housing units that the state is demanding. Trevor O'Neill, a council member from Anaheim, should be contacted by our council to find out the details of the lawsuit, the status, and what they feel the chances are to prevail. We need to actively fight what the state is demanding us to do by filling an amic filing an amicus brief and discussing this matter with Simi Valley and other cities in and out of Ventura County and what they're planning to do about this. Kings Road in West Hollywood, which was a nearby street to where I grew up, used to be full of stately mansions, one owned by the former wife of President Reagan. One home was built by Frank Lloyd Wright. Most of the mansions were torn down and condos were built. 30 units and more where one home used to be. This happened to other areas where houses were replaced by condos. Not only did this increase traffic, like on La Cienega Boulevard, which looks like a parking lot rather than a street, 
but guest parking on the streets is virtually impossible. Thank you, Mrs. Moret. This is just one example. Oh. Um, next up, we have Andy Levine. Oh yeah, I'm Andy Levine, Newbury Park, California. I, I just want to yield my time to my um, to Sherry Moret. Um, the parking on the street is virtually impossible. This is just one example of how adversely our community will I'm be hit. I'm sorry, um, you cannot, it, Andy needs to continue. Oh, okay. Our council oh, rules actually don't okay. allow for someone else to take over another person's okay, time. Go right over here. This is just one. Thank you. This is just one example of how advertising our community will be hit by the state if you allow this to happen. Today, while writing this letter, there is a blackout in Newbury Park. Most, um, must we live with generators and expensive utilities and shortage of water? We need planned communities. Do listen to your senses. Yes, school enrollment is down. However, not necessary due to young families not finding housing here but also due to opting for private schools or homeschooling as there are conflicts with the school curriculum and poor choices as to do what's allowed in the school attire in the classrooms. They want their children to be prepared for fitting into society. Please look into the seriously housing matter and see what we can do to help Orange County cities and our own. Thank you. Thank you very much, and that concludes public comments. Mr. Powers. Thanks so much, Madam Mayor. Uh, just a couple notes of uh, follow-up. Um, the um, uh, speaker that mentioned um, uh, City of Gora Hills action and electrification of uh, new development. Um, our sustainability unit um, is uh, working on uh, working on that and uh, is involved in the climate action plan so that'll be coming back to the council through that uh, process um, the speaker had concerns about uh, community development and um, uh, uh, we are aware of that issue I saw that uh, community development director Kelvin Parker uh, made connection with her uh, issue regarding a accessory dwelling unit and some setbacks uh, there so staff is working uh, on that, and Kelvin will be in touch with her again tomorrow, I understand. Um, and then finally, um, the um, final speakers that mentioned uh, the lawsuits. The lawsuit that was mentioned is actually filed by Orange County uh, uh, COG, uh, not individual cities. They filed it on behalf of uh, some of the cities. But just as a reminder to the public and to the council, um, most of the arena allocations in the SCAG, this SCAG region last cycle went into Orange County. So. Uh, the speaker mentioned Anaheim, just to give you a, a flavor of the number for Ana Anaheim, we're talking about um, 17,400 units is their arena allocation, uh, as opposed to the 2,600 that the city of Thousand Oaks uh, received. So Ventura County, uh, thanks to some strong lobbying efforts uh, and otherwise was, was certainly the, the net beneficiary of this last cycle in terms of, uh, of reductions. So certainly those cities in Orange County, they are facing some significant numbers, can understand the legal challenges there. Thank you, Mr. Powers. Um, I see uh, normally council members don't speak um, after that, but go ahead. Well, well thank you. I'd like yeah. to, um, Mr. Powers and uh, Ms. Newman, questions for you is that one of my uh, bones of contention is Sacramento imposing its will upon the cities, Thousand Oaks being one of them, through the arena numbers. Questions always been raised as to whether the accuracy of those arena numbers are, are uh, correct and regardless of whether it's a city county or a private group bringing this lawsuit against the uh, state of California for imposing these incredible numbers upon cities yes we got uh, by with 2600 that doesn't mean we don't stand up for our partner cities who have had this imposition because we could be next uh, I'd like to have our council take serious consideration of an amicus brief and how this has injured and damaged uh, the cities by imposing these numbers upon the cities without organic growth, but self-imposed growth by Sacramento. And I'd like our council members and uh, Mr. Powers, if we can put this perhaps on the agenda in the fall when we come back to discuss 
to see if we do want to do an amicus brief in this regard. I think that would be very timely, very very uh, uh, important in the sending a message to Sacramento that we've had enough and we're not going to take it anymore. This wouldn't be the first time I think we're attempting something like this, Ms. Noonan, but go ahead. Yeah, so, oops. So obviously this is not on the agenda, so we cannot discuss it tonight, but we can certainly discuss it in the future. Um, an amicus brief is usually filed on appeal. I'm not sure amicus briefs apply at the original trial court level, but it's something that I can look into. Thank you. All right, we now go to item number seven, which is the consent calendar. Are there any items which my colleagues would like to discuss in particular? None, then I will look for a motion. Mayor Pro Tem Engler? Yes, let's move the consent calendar, please. Madam Clerk? Council Member Adam? Yes. Council Member McNamee? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Engler? Yes. And Mayor Bill de la Pena? Yes. And that motion carries 4-0, and your ordinance titles are Ordinance Amending Sections of Municipal Code Adjusting Campaign Contribution Limits to Reflect Changes in California Consumer Price Index and Setting Reevaluation Time Frame for Base Limit, and Ordinance Amending the Provisions of Chapter 25 of Title V, the Mobile Home Rent Stabilization of the Thousand Oaks Municipal Code, MCA 2021-70174, Ordinance Number 1686-NS. Thank you. We will now go to department reports. 9A is the Hill Canyon Treatment Plant Master Plan, and that, I believe, will be presented by our Public Works Deputy Director, Nader Haydari, and also John Minkle, our Utility Superintendent. Good evening. Yes, good evening, Mayor and members of the Council. Uh, I'm Nader Haydari, and joining me tonight, and who will be delivering the uh, presentation is John Minkle. He is the city's uh, utility superintendent which uh, and the chief plant operator of the Hill Canyon treatment plant. And in that capacity, he oversees the city's water distribution system, wastewater collection system, Hill Canyon treatment plant, and the city's environmental compliance program. So just wanted to give him that introduction here um, uh, before he initiates his first uh, presentation. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Mayor and members of the Council. We are here this evening to, to present to you this department report on the recently completed Hill Canyon Treatment Plant Master Plan. The city acquired Hill Canyon Treatment Plant in 1966 from Conejo Valley Sanitary District. Since then, the city completed major plant expansion projects and multiple upgrades as the city was developing. The last major expansion was completed in the early 2000s. Prior to these expansions, very detailed preliminary design reports were completed to plan the projects in order to meet the growing needs of the city and to meet evolving regulatory requirements. However, there has not been a comprehensive master plan completed for the facility until now. Project conception started in 2017, a scope was developed in 2018, and Council awarded the project to the consulting firm Gannett Fleming in 2019. City plant and engineering staff worked very collaboratively with the consulting team and provided valuable input, 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 input to the project, which was completed and posted in 2021. Hill Canyon is one of the most critical pieces of public works infrastructure that nearly everyone in Thousand Oaks relies on every day. The plant currently treats 8 million gallons per day of wastewater from Thousand Oaks, collected from over 400 miles of pipelines citywide. The value of the plant, based, based on the 2017 asset management plan and adjusted for inflation, is estimated at 150 million in today's dollars. With some original plant infrastructure dating back to the 1960s and the most recent facilities now close to 20 years old, staff saw the need to take a detailed look at the entire plant and its processes and identify needs for the long-term planning of infrastructure maintenance, as well as areas for improvements. The new master plan looked at these elements, including flow rates, regulatory requirements, renewable energy, 
and use of the treated water to provide recommendations and a 10-year capital planning outlook. We'll touch on each of these in elements in this report. First, the master plan looked at historic and current wastewater flows and characteristics. In the 1960s, flow rates were around 4 million gallons per day. In the 70s through the 90s, the city was developing and flows increased to between 8 and 10 million gallons. From 1998 to 2008, flows ranged between 10 and a half and 11 and a half million gallons per day, with a peak of 12 in 2005. Since then, flows have reduced back to the early 1990s rates and currently average between 8 and 9 million gallons per day. This recent reduction in flow rates is attributable in part to water conservation efforts from drought conditions, as well as sewer line re rehabilitation efforts over the years, reducing inflow and infiltration from stormwater and groundwater finding its way into the sewer system. For future plant flow rates, the then available 2015 Urban Water Management Plan and the 2018 Water Master Plan were utilized. Population projection estimates from census data and future potable water consumption estimates in gallons per capita per day were applied to historical wastewater trending. From these calculations, the consultant anticipated flow rates at the treatment plant will increase slowly to a rate of about 9.4 million gallons per day by the year 2040, still well within the design capacity of 14 million gallons per day. A condition assessment was completed for all the existing facilities which helped identify refurbishment, replacement, or upgrade opportunities resulting from infrastructure condition or process related issues. While many of the structures have been upgraded or newly installed in the several plant expansions, much of the newer infrastructure is already 20 years old, and the oldest infrastructure is approximately 60 years old. Maintaining this infrastructure is essential for continued successful operation of the facility and service to the community. Analysis was done and options were considered for updated technology where applicable and specific projects were developed and prioritized based on criticality, consequence of failure, asset useful life, and opportunities for optimization. The red circles indicate various areas with projects identified from this condition assessment. Next, process modeling software was utilized to duplicate the operation of the facility in a virtual environment. Different parameters were tested to identify areas for optimization strategies. By and large, due to a dedicated, attentive, and highly qualified treatment plant staff, the facility was found to be operating very efficiently and well within design criteria and regulatory parameters. As anticipated, some opportunities for optimization were identified and recommendations were provided. Another section of the master plan was dedicated to analysis of the plant's renewable energy portfolio which currently includes a solar array and a cogeneration system. The solar array is capable of producing roughly half of the energy demands of the plant during peak sun hours. The cogen system utilizes gas produced from the treatment process to fuel an engine and generator in order to produce electricity for the plant. It also produces the heat needed as part of the solids treatment process, hence the term cogeneration for combined heat and power. Hill Canyon has an existing FOG, or Fats, Oils, and Greases, receiving station, where grease is accepted from local restaurants and utilized in the treatment process to augment gas production, and therefore increases renewable energy potential from the cogen system. The master plant looked at current and historical performance and alternative technologies, and provided recommendations for potential upgrades and optimization to maximize the renewable energy potential. Recommendations from the study included building a new, more robust fog receiving station. This will help stabilize digester gas production for power generation, address current deficiencies with the existing fog system, and improve the life cycle and efficient operation of the associated equipment. City Council recently approved an agreement to begin design of this project. Several equipment upgrades were also recommended for both the cogen facility and the solar array to maximize energy output from each facility. Also recommended was a battery backup system for the treatment plant. This will enable greater efficiency for renewable energy production, as well as use of renewable energy during Edison power outages and less dependence on traditional diesel power generator backup. Terms for this include islanding and microgrids. 
The city's sustainability staff have already secured grant funding and council has approved an agreement to design and construct the city's first microgrid facility at the Hill Canyon treatment plant. Design of that system is currently underway. Efficient use of our water resources, identifying potential new sources of water, and less dependency on imported water have been goals of water agencies throughout California for years. Drought and weather conditions have expedited further evaluations. One task of the Hill Canyon Master Plan was to evaluate different alternatives for reuse of the treated water. Treated water from Hill Canyon is currently being recycled beneficially through a long-term agreement with Camarosa Water District. The treated water joins the adjacent Arroyo Conejo Creek and flows downstream, where Camarosa diverts most of that water for irrigation purposes at local farms. Some water continues to flow downstream to the Magoo Lagoon and the Pacific Ocean, supporting the environmental habitat along the way. Many, alternatives for, many alternative uses for Hill Canyon treated water were considered as part of the master plan as potential changes for water reuse could impact how water is processed at the facility. Six alternatives were selected for more detailed consideration, represented here in the order which they were evaluated in the master plan. Alternative one is no change. Continue with the existing contract with Camarosa Water District for the sale and use of our reclaimed water through the contract expiration in year 2053. This continues the beneficial use of water in the region, specifically in the Camarillo and Oxnard Plain. The total amount of water being reused is approximately 8,000 acre feet per year. Conservation credits are also accumulated by both Camarosa and the city for offsetting the need to extract groundwater from Fox Canyon Groundwater Management Agency. Alternative number two is modify the existing cost structure with Camarosa. Should the need arise or an opportunity present itself requiring a change to the existing contract, consider the opportunity to simultaneously change the pricing structure. Currently, the cost of water is adjusted each year based on changes to consumer price index. Alternative number two ties the annual change in cost of the recycled water to increase in proportion to the annual increases in the cost of imported domestic water instead of CPI. This change would more closely reflect the value of the recycled water. Alternatives three, four, and five involve indirect potable reuse within the local region. Indirect potable reuse, or IPR, is the addition of recycled water to augment groundwater or surface water with the intended purpose of supplementing a water supply to a public water system. IPR has been going on for decades in certain areas of California via groundwater augmentation. However, surface water augmentation is relatively recent, with regulations being adopted in California just in the last year or so. IPR involves the addition of reverse osmosis facility onto the back end of a wastewater treatment process, otherwise called an advanced water purification facility, or sometimes called advanced water treatment plant. For Hill Canyon, this would mean adding reverse osmosis to the existing process. Rather than discharging all water to the creek, some would have to continue to flow down the creek for environmental purposes, a large percentage of treated water would be transported to other areas in the region for eventual domestic use. Three areas were looked at for potential IPR. The first, alternative number three, was Santa Rosa Valley, via a potential connection to Camarosa Water District at the intersection of Santa Rosa Road and Hill Canyon Access Road. From that point, Camarosa would take the purified water and inject it into the groundwater basin through deep well injection or spreading basins. The second area considered was Lake Bard, alternative number four. Purified water would be transported from Hill Canyon treatment plant to Lake Bard to be used as a surface water augmentation source for Cayugas Municipal Water District at their potable water treatment facility on Olson Road. The third indirect potable reuse option considered, alternative number five, is Las Virginis Reservoir. Las Virginis Municipal Water District and Triunfo Sanitation District, together through their joint powers agreement, are currently embarking on a pure water project, which aims to boost local supplies of treated and recycled water in the eastern end of the Conejo Valley. 
This project may be able to generate up to 5,000 acre feet per year of new local and sustainable potable water supply for the region and is anticipated to begin operation by the year 2030. The Pure Water Project includes construction of an advanced water treatment plant in a business park off Agora Road in the city of Westlake Village. The advanced treatment plant would further treat water that was already treated at the Tapia Wastewater Treatment Facility. The advanced treated water, or Pure Water, would then be sent to augment fresh water in Los Virginis Reservoir. The combined water source would then be treated for domestic water use at the existing Westlake Filtration Plant a drinking water treatment plant that has been operating since 1990. One major advantage to this IPR alternative is that an advanced treatment plant would not be needed at Hill Canyon. The city would transport its existing level of treated water through a new recycled water pipeline to the Los Virginis Advanced Treatment Plant. From there, it would go to Los Virginis Reservoir, be treated again to drinking water standards, and return to the city, city via an interconnection with Los Virginis, or be wielded through Cayegas Municipal Water District. This alternative also proposes serving some potential recycled water customers for irrigation purposes along the new pipeline alignment. Alternative number six is the use of Hill Canyon treated water as recycled water for parks and landscapes solely within the city. This would involve designing and constructing a separate recycled water distribution system, complete with pipelines, meters, other appurtenances typical of a freshwater system, and a pumping facility to transport the water from Hill Canyon up to and throughout the city to future recycled water customers. Note that the Las Virginis alternative would include an abbreviated version of the recycled water option for irrigation use within the city. Net present value, or NPV, was utilized as well as qualitative criteria to evaluate and compare the alternatives. Net present value was needed for quantitative assessment due to the complexity of the alternatives. Revenues and costs for a period of 20 years were discounted to the present value and summed to compare each alternative. A positive net present value signifies revenue exceeding the costs. Zero is revenue neutral, and negative is cost exceeding the revenues. This chart shows the preliminary results evaluating the six alternatives, showing upfront capital costs, new water generated in the Conejo Valley, and estimated net present value for each item. Note that two of the alternatives have a large negative NPV. This is due to the very high upfront capital costs associated with building an advanced water purification facility at Hill Canyon, as well as long distance pipelines. The master plan ranks alternatives one, two, five, and six as the preferred alternatives. No change to the existing agreement with Camrosa and modifying the existing price structure rank with the highest net present value. However, they, la they lack the introduction of new water to the Thousand Oaks area. Furthermore, modifying the existing agreement with Camrosa by raising the price would require some alternative incentive for Camrosa and or some other need or opportunity to open the contract. This existing agreement is valid through the year 2053. Options five and six provide a new water source to the Thousand Oaks area and have a positive net present value. They are more complex in terms of regulatory issues, schedule for implementation, and stakeholder collaboration. The Hill Canyon Treatment Plant Master Plan provides this high level conceptual analysis for the purpose of understanding how potential alternatives for reuse of Hill Canyon water could impact plant operations or infrastructure needs over the next decade. The scope of analysis was not intended to provide a definitive answer to the question of whether the city should pursue one of these alternatives. Rather, it helped us confirm and identify capital projects for Hill Canyon so we can prepare and make the necessary improvements for the future and identify and open the door for additional opportunities for regional collaboration. As such, the master plan recommends a project to engage in further study should the city wish to do so. These are the partner and neighboring agencies that we are currently engaging in further discussions and collaborating with to work toward common regional water resource goals. The output of the master plan included a draft 10-year capital improvement program. 17 projects had already been identified by city staff in the previous 2019 to 2021 capital improvement budget. 
The master plan validated these projects and adjusted budgetary estimates, timelines, and project scopes to maximize efficiency of these projects with related recommendations from the study. 34 new projects were identified directly addressing the recommendations from this study. Of those, two projects were identified for further study and potential implementation, but were not assigned cost estimates at this time. Previously identified projects were integrated with newly identified projects, ranked for priority, and spread out over a timeline of 10 years, keeping in mind the anticipated revenue stream for the wastewater fund. Several of these projects were incorporated into the recently adopted fiscal year 2021 to 23 capital improvement budget, and the others will be recommended for incorporation into future budget cycles. In conclusion, the Hill Canyon Master Plan is an integral part of the planning for the future. It provides very detailed analyses of historic and existing plant operations, infrastructure maintenance activities, and environmental sustainability efforts. The study revealed that, city, that the city has been doing a great job operating and maintaining the plant efficiently and sustainably, meeting regulatory requirements, and providing this vital service to the community of Thousand Oaks to preserve and protect public and environmental health. Furthermore, the project itself showed the high level of collaboration and teamwork within the organization between city engineering staff, operations staff, sustainability, and various other support staff who worked together with a great consulting team to successfully complete this project. This concludes our report. Staff recommends that Council receive and file the Hill Canyon Treatment Plant Master Plan and its findings and recommendations. Thank you so much, Mr. Minko. Appreciate that, Mr. Haidari. This is uh, quite the master plan and one to be very proud of. Absolutely. We do have a public speaker, but I have a question from Council Member or a statement from Council Member McNamee. Uh, uh, first, a question and then a statement. Mm -hmm. The uh, federal government is coming forth with uh, new budgets that earmark specifically infrastructure development and water being one of them. Is this figured into your net present value or is that just an added bonus if we do get grants from the federal government in this regard? Yeah, I can, I can take that. Yeah, that, that additional funding was not accounted for and so if we are able to uh, secure, successfully secure additional grant funding for any of these projects, that would help the uh, net present value calculation for any and all of them. So this could actually look better than what we have right now. So yes, our, our yes. positive cash flow would be even greater. Yes. Super. I, I am excited to hear that because water has become more and more scarce. And as we have demands of increased housing in all the cities throughout California, water is going to become more and more of a commodity. And anything we, anything we can do as a city to become less dependent on imported water from Los Angeles, I am very much in favor of simply because if you look 20, 30 years in the future, what we do now will make it a tremendous impact on our sustainability as a city in the future. Uh, as a professor at Ventura College in the Water Science Department, where I train the good women and men that go and work in your water plants throughout the Southern California area, I can tell the public here that there's a tremendous cooperation among the water agencies in this region and in this state, and they all try to work cooperatively to make certain that water is shared at where it needs to go and uh, work quite cooperatively, which I'd, I'd like to acknowledge. Right now, I believe it's $1,700 per acre foot wholesale for water. Is that correct? That's not the retail value, that's the wholesale value. 1700 is that a correct number? Yeah, correct. So that's anticipated to go up at about 4% a year, is that correct? I believe our projections are even slightly higher than that. As so we, it is definitely going up uh, regardless of inflation. It's still going to go up regardless. Okay. So again, as water's becoming more and more scarce, housing demand goes up, increased water demand here in the area. And what I'm hearing you propose is one option is we take the uh, treatment, w treated water from the wastewater plant, bring it back around as one model, is to send it to Los Virgins Water District where they have a reverse osmosis plant that could treat it to an ultra pure level and then use it in any way, shape or form. Is this water that we send to Los Virginis gonna help reduce our water rates because instead of us putting it out in nature to feed Bambi, Tweety Bird, and Thumper, we're now putting it back into our system here to reduce our demand from Los Angeles and reduce our water rates. Is that a possibility? Yes, that's a possibility. The net present value calculations are kind of related to the same issue. So 
whatever alternative is pursued, it, it depends if it's a revenue positive or neutral alternative and as compared to the current situation. So that would then eventually be factored into our subsequent rate studies that would be performed um, for that. I think it's a reasonable goal if we can keep money in the Canal Valley and not send it to Los Angeles or other counties. Uh, that stimulates our economy, more money to go around to buy product and service within the Canal Valley, and thus more revenue for the city to provide services that we do, is my point, from an economic standpoint. Um, I'm very excited about this. I think it's timely. It's what other cities are doing around the country, and we can actually become less dependent on imported water, more dependent on us, reduce our water rates as a possibility, and anticipate for water becoming more and more scarce, leaving more water for the Central Valley to, for our farmers to uh, grow their crops. Uh, the next step I would like to see us take is stormwater capture and reuse. Is that in the works right now? Are we talking about looking at those models as potential stormwater capture and reuse along these same lines? Yeah, so that would be a separate venture. However, there's interrelation because it, it's very likely that if we're going to capture stormwater, it would uh, likely wind up having to go through the wastewater treatment plant to be treated and processed in some fashion. So there is some overlap that wasn't uh, ex exhaustively explored in this particular study. It was more focused on the operations of the plant itself as opposed to the, the storm drain collection system in town. But that is certainly another area that we're looking to pursue. Okay, great. Glad that's an option. How's the cooperation with the other cities of Simi Valley, Moore Park, uh, Oak Park, and so forth, uh, Calabasas? How is their cooperation in dealing with this issue? of water reuse and trying to get water to all the residents here in the area. Yeah, as we had depicted earlier on one of the slides, uh, there are some several uh, neighboring um, agencies and water purveyors that we're working with. However, we are not uh, working outside of our city limits with other cities because we, uh, we're focusing more on the pur purveyors and the wholesalers that are in Thousand Oaks uh, proper. Thank you, yeah. tremendous work. Thank you very much. You. And you guys are on the forefront that in 30 years we'll all appreciate. Thank you. Council Member Adam. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, fellas. I see by the report that uh, Hill Canyon can process 14 million gallons of water, wastewater per day, correct? And that's the capacity. What are we actually processing? Yes, so we're, we're currently treating about 8 million gallons per day. But we can process up to 14 million, correct? Yes. And correct. we project in the next 20 years that, may, that 8 million may go to about 9 million, correct? Yes, correct. Okay. I mean, the reason I bring this up is because we're often asked, uh, will our infrastructure be able to support any kind of moderate growth we might have in the next 20 years? And when it comes to Hill Canyon Treatment Plant, we can easily support any type of moderate growth we've had and still be under capacity in the next 20 years. Is that correct? Yes, that's no. correct. There's, okay. there's sufficient room. Very good. And as far as these different choices here, um, the, the business of modifying the contract with Camrosa, uh, they, they do pay us annually for the money that we discharge into the ag lands and the water basin and all that. How much do they pay us a year? Yes, correct. Um, they pay, you know, currently it's around six to $800,000 per year. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't know if this term would be relatable to that, but would you say we're getting full cost recovery for the water that we're processing and then pushing out to the benefit of Camrosa? Uh, no, I, I would not say that. It, it costs more to treat the water than it does than we are receiving back um, for its use. Yes. I see. Okay. Well, that's interesting. So as far as number two, there could be some basis to maybe take a, another look at this contract with Camrosa, correct? Yeah, yeah, there, that would be one of the elements, whether it's uh, environmental regulations that change or something that would change that would prompt that uh, contract to potentially be reopened. Mm -hmm. the, the initiation of that agreement included uh, some improvements that Camrosa constructed downstream for that diversion structure, and they were related to several environmental permits and other uh, aspects. So it, it wasn't uh, ever initiated as a strictly a financial only contract. There's mm -hmm. other elements to it. I um, see. 
yeah, environmental yeah. benefits and et cetera. I say, well, you know, one of the tenants we always operate under is full cost recovery, so we might take a little closer look at that. And then uh, finally, uh, yeah, I really appreciate the, the regional approach that we're, do, we're, that we're undertaking here because we need to be re less reliant on uh, imported water than we are. And I think there's a lot of promise with uh, Las Virginia's Municipal Water District with their treatment plant where we could recycle our water through their plant and then back to us again. Sounds very cost efficient and, uh, and as you say, a positive net present value. So look forward to that developing. Thank you. Thank you, and now Mayor Pro Tem Engler. Thank you, Madam Mayor, um, and thank you for the presentation and also the hard work on the, uh, the, 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 the plan. Uh, we hadn't had a plan in place for a long time, and I appreciate you taking the effort and making that happen. So um, I, I did read through the plan uh, yesterday and today. Um, I guess I, I learned a lot about solid waste or um, water water waste management that perhaps I didn't really want to know about, but um, I appreciate the hard work you guys are doing. Um, there's a lot of plans in place now for improvements and and uh, updating and stuff like that. Will that affect the um, capacity of the plant? Will it stay the same? Will it be about the about what it is now? Yeah, so I believe we touched on that briefly a, a, a few minutes ago. The plan as it was uh, initiated in 2019 didn't have the advantage of capturing the full um, final results of the general plan uh, update, which is still you know in process. So, but even with that said, given that the, the plant is currently operating at 8 million gallons a day and knowing that the capacity is 14, you know, provides sufficient capacity for that uh, projected growth. Okay, I noticed. I noticed in the in the the plan, there's quite a bit of discussion on uh, getting storm water. Um, explain a little bit more about that to me. Is that storm water that flows through the storm channels, or is it storm water that falls on the plant? That because of the nature of the business down there, we have to make sure that it's not contaminated. Yeah. So right now, there's both of those, uh, and the idea currently, the the storm drain system in town is completely separated from the wastewater collection system and, and several towns back east they're combined systems but in you know out here they're, they're totally separate however that uh, storm drain system has a, a resource in it there there's there's water in there that could be potentially reused so that's where the the cross connection that that tie-in uh, could potentially come in to divert some of the storm water flow and bring it into the plant and uh, gain additional resource additional uh, water to be to be uh, benefited from and do we have capacity at the, at the plant to take in any um, uh, typical rainfall storms here, or, or is that something we're looking at? Those stormwater capture programs are typically focused around dry weather flow and not around trying to capture the uh, full rain event when they occur because it was simply will overwhelm, and you know, John will have more details, but that is not something that the, the plant would be able to be the uh, size to capture the actual you know, major storm events. It would be more more geared toward the, 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 the daily flow that uh, occurs in the, in, the, in the creeks and gutters. And, and is, is that a watershed protection district um, uh, area that they work with, or how do we interact with watershed protection? So yeah, the watershed protection district does uh, have jurisdiction over some of the larger storm drains in town, but uh, we would likely focus the effort on our own storm drain system, which is uh, maybe not the large, you know, 12 foot wide channels, but the, uh, you know, the, the, the smaller ones, although we have several that are in the range of, you know, eight foot uh, diameter pipes and so forth. So there, we would focus it more on our own uh, elements. But the entire concept that would be uh, evaluated would, would consider all possible alternatives. Well, I was, I was very happy to see uh, just the whole tone of the document was, um, it, most people look at our, our uh, wastewater treatment plant as a service or as a necessary evil, so to speak. Um, there are some viable products that are produced there, and uh, I, I appreciate the tone of your document that recognize that there are, there are uh, products there that are saleable and that are worth recovering. So uh, thank you for that, and thank you for that emphasis. Thank you, and we now go to our only public speaker, Kat. Can, can I ask one final follow-up? I'm sorry, I had a request in there. Oh, it was shut off. Uh, just one point I want to clarify. Mr. Adam had a very good example of uh, the costs, but I want to bring it down to different terms here. 
that right now Camarosa, we revenue wise are getting back about $125 per acre foot. Is that, a, is that correct? That is roughly uh, the, the current amount. And yet amount. It's, we're getting one, $125 back per acre foot from them for the use of the water, yet it's $1,700 wholesale. And that difference, to Mr. Adams' Adam point, is the difference of not net new, neutral. We're, we're actually losing money on that for what we could be making if we were sent it over to Las Virgins to have them do their reverse osmosis and reuse it again, correct? Yes, there were, obviously there's capital infrastructure costs associated with many of these alternatives to get the water to those locations or participate in the costs of the uh, eventual uh, RO treatment, the reverse osmosis uh, treatment that would be necessary to make the water potable. So currently the water is not potable, so uh, we can't quite compare the, the, those two numbers, the wholesale cost of potable water versus the, the cost that we're receiving for the, the discharge from the treatment plant. Uh, but, but in concept, yes. Okay, thank you. Joining us via video is our only public speaker, Kat Selm. Good evening. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and Council Members. My name is Kat and I'm a resident of Thousand Oaks and I'd like to talk about water for people tonight. However, as a natural resource professional, I'm very much in support of Flows for Nature, AKA Bambi and Tweety Bird, as all beneficial users should not be denied water resources. The future of water resource availability uh, for all in Southern California is at risk due to our changing climate. Given this fact, we need to make strategic investments in our infrastructure to ensure continued viability of Thousand Oaks. According to the projected changes for Ventura County climate models initiated by the Watershed Coalition Ventura County and the Desert Research Institute, the climate models for VC consistently project increases in the annual number of dry days with little to no change in overall precip. This suggests that the same amount of precipitation must fall in fewer days, requiring an intensification of daily precip. The concept of intensification is further supported by the modeling that shows an increase in the frequency of days with precipitation exceeding the 85th percentile. This trend means more dry days, which in turn means a higher likelihood of wildfire activity. For several years following a fire, runoff rates can more than double due to fire-driven changes in soil properties that render it water repellent and reduce infiltration. In addition, groundwater recharge is projected to decrease in the Southwest in a warming climate and may in part be related to increasing rainfall intensity. Precipitation intensification at the seasonal to sub daily time scales may have implication for the methods by which groundwater recharges or how surface water is conveyed, captured and stored for us all. All these factors result in more dry days, more wildfires, more flashy flows, more runoff, less infiltration and less groundwater recharge. In addition, according to DWR, climate change is predicted to significantly decrease snowpack from the Sierra Nevadas by 48 to 65 percent due to warmer temperatures. This will melt the Sierra Nevada snow faster and earlier, making it more difficult for California to store and use throughout the dry season. This will directly and negatively impact Thousand Oaks' ability to draw water supply from the state water project. The multiplying uncertainties we're facing due to climate change requires more diversified and integrated water resource acquisition and distribution. The logical conclusion of all these models is that more stormwater needs to be captured and retained on site, as well as repurposed, reused to be prepared for the aridification and water scarcity that we're going to face. The Conejo Climate Coalition urges the City Council to consider the merit of the six potential future alternatives waiting higher for reduced resilience on imported water. This will better align with the city's goal number one, which is to maximize the beneficial reuse of HCTP effluent to uh, support citywide efforts on reducing reliance on imported water by maximizing beneficial re reuse of this effluent. We also believe that the diverting the flows from the 30 year events to Conejo Creek is potentially a wasted opportunity for increased water resilience. Instead, public works should further explore finding a way to capture and reuse the 4.4 million gallons that's currently storage deficient. Thank you. We Thank, Thank you. Your time has been up. Thank you. Any comments uh, from staff that were um, about the points that were raised right now by the speaker? Yes, sure. Um, yeah, staff agrees that the, one of the primary goals um, uh, of the master plan is maximizing the beneficial use of our effluent from the treatment plan. That was one of the uh, goals that the master plan was um, uh, developed around and that this you know uh, 
uh, speaks to our pursuit and exploration of some of these alternatives, including alternatives five and six, although they may not have as high of a net present value as uh, the current model that we're um, developing with the sale of the discharge to Camrosa, they are still worth being explored because they may be able to develop a, an additional new water supply for the Caneo Valley. So we are definitely pursuing those alternatives. Very good. Mr. Adam, did you have a motion or a question? Uh, well, I could make a motion. I just thought the previous speaker uh, would like to know uh, as far as the plant itself and greenhouse gases between, and I think I'm correct in saying this, between the solar array that we have out there, which is incredible, and the cogeneration from the biogas, this plant is virtually self-sufficient, is it not? No. Uh, yes, it, it is capable of being self-sufficient. However, there are always uh, opportunities for optimization um, for both those systems, both the solar and the cogen facility. And the master plan really went into detail on, on what those optimization strategies would be to help optimize those mm -hmm. resources. Right, to even uh, amplify the cogeneration with the fog, fats, oils, and grease. Love that. Right. Anyway. We're, we're uh, proud of the fact that uh, we're not adding to GHGs with this plant. And with that, yeah, Mayor. Pardon me, Mayor? No, no motions actually needed. Oh, no motions no. needed. <laughs> well, how about that? <laughs> then I withdraw my motion that I never made. Okay. All right. <laughs> so this is the receive and file. Mr. Powers. Yeah, just to uh, put a final point here, I just wanted to thank... Uh, um, Mr. Minkle, uh, great job on the presentation, and uh, uh, Nader. Um, this um, is a substantial document, and uh, I think the public and the council sees items on the council consent calendar that have been budgeted that are line items uh, in there with consistency. And uh, you know that that's rooted and based in a document like this that has uh, been thoroughly reviewed by outside parties and, and otherwise. But I think more importantly, uh, this is a document that has a lot of innovative ideas in it. And I, I think it serves as the, the genesis of a lot of future uh, uh, partnerships and collaborations that are out there and uh, I just want to take a moment to thank the team uh, thank the council for your continued vigilance and funding the projects there because it helps to keep us on that uh, bleeding edge absolutely thank you and with that this is received and filed and thank you so much for that presentation well done we now move on to item 9b which is our legislative platform and that will be presented by Mr. Powers, and our Legislative Affairs Manager, Mina Leba. I'm just the warm-up act as Mina's getting transitioned uh, up there. Just uh, wanted to take a moment. Uh, we wanted to have Mina um, uh, do a quick presentation this evening because I don't think we highlight enough the fact that uh, we're very fortunate in this community to have a Legislative Affairs uh, manager. Um, many cities do not. Uh, I know that because I get calls from other city managers asking all the time if they can borrow or leverage um, various work product that our legislative affairs manager has uh, put together and relationships that she has built. So um, this is our annual legislative platform. It's an important document. It's a document that doesn't exist in many cities, but it's one that uh, really helps to keep uh, the council and the community focused on those opportunities that we have uh, to uh, lend advocacy to important aspects uh, for council's priorities and, and goals. And Mina does a great job looking forward to her presentation this evening. Thank you so much. Good evening, council. The item before you tonight is the city's legislative platform. Every two years when the city adopts a new budget, a legislative pat platform is updated and brought to you for adoption. Let me, pardon me, let me start the slideshow. In 2006, Thousand Oaks was one of the first cities to adopt a platform and dedicate staff to oversee a legislative program. 
With the fast pace of the legislature and the inability to determine when bills will be heard in policy committees, the platform allows staff to streamline and expedite advocacy efforts for both state and federal policies. The foundation for the platform is simple, to maximize local control and to advocate to enhance, preserve and protect our local budget. The city, however, does not take positions on issues where we have no direct authority or doesn't impact municipal operations. Examples include gun rights, reproductive health, international relations and trade policies. The platform is guided by the state and national league with the support of our state and federal lobbyists who assist the city in identifying key priorities and issues. Staff also reviews legislative interests of professional organizations such as the American Planners Association, California State Municipal Finance Officers, and the California State Sheriff's Association. The city also engages with organizations dedicated to special issues, including the California Association of Sanitation Agencies, the California Product Stewardship Council, and the California Stormwater Quality Association, and many more. Council members have had the opportunity to guide both the state and national league in legislative positions by participating in policy committees and vetting legislation. In addition to sending letters of advocacy, staff coordinates meetings with district offices and the state capitol to discuss legislative positions and even testify at hearings. During the current legislative cycle, the mayor served as lead testimony at the Senate Judiciary Committee, and this week she'll testify at the Assembly, Communications and Conveyance Committee, and Senate Governance and Finance Committee. The city also holds annual meetings with its federal delegation in Washington, D.C. to advocate for local interests, projects, and funding. Due to the pandemic, the mayor and Mayor Pro Tem had a virtual fly-in with Congresswoman Brownlee and the offices of Senators Feinstein and Padilla in May. During the last legislative cycle, the city was instrumental in the passage of AB 434, which would streamline affordable housing grants program, AB 1788, which would prohibit the use of anticoagulant rodenticides until the California Department of Pesticide Regulations does further analysis and, it's, and determines its adverse effects on wildlife. AB 1775, which would increase penalties for knowingly using the 911 emergency system for the purpose of harassing another. SB 1186 would increase penalties for price gouging during a state of emergency. The city also supported efforts to kill bad housing legislation, such as AB 1279, which would have allowed multifamily housing with greater height and density in high opportunity areas, AB 3107 and SB 1385, which would have made housing developments allowable in commercial retail zones, SB 899, which would have allowed housing development by right for higher education and religious institutions, SB 902, which would allow cities to pass ordinances to zone up to 10 units of residential density per parcel at a height specified if it is close to a transit-rich, jobs-rich area, and SB 1138, which would have required housing elements to allow emergency shelters in mixed-use and residential zones. In the midst of the pandemic cycle, the city received 14 million over two years for the American Rescue Plan Act to address financial losses due to the pandemic. The city applied for congressionally directed funding. You may also know this as earmarks for three public works projects. The city was selected by Con Congresswoman Brownlee's office for $1.5 million to support the groundwater reuse project, which is pending approval before Congress. 
After years of meetings with the Library of Congress, the Brimhall Library is in the process of transferring the American Radio Archive Collection to UC Santa Barbara for preservation and digitization. The city is also awaiting word on a federal small business administration shuttered venue grant to support losses by the Bank of America Performing Arts Center during the pandemic closure. Looking at the next legislative cycle, the city will have a number of opportunities ahead with the passage of a $1 trillion federal infrastructure project, the implementation of a state trailer bill, or SB 129, which directs $1 billion in funding for local governments to address homelessness, $1 billion in fire, wildfire prevention, $3.7 in climate change and resiliency, $1.3 billion in water and wastewater projects, and $3.75 billion in broadband infrastructure and access. Congress is working on a surface transportation reauthorization. There are new opportunities for additional congressional directed spending, AKA earmarks, federal grant opportunities with the pending budget reconciliation bill. A new FEMA grant has just emerged on microgrids for wildfire hazard mitigation. Finally, as you recall, after each census, the state convenes a redistricting commission to create new state and federal political boundaries. The city has begun testifying at the California Redistricting Commission hearings to protect our boundaries and more importantly, to keep our city whole. New boundaries will be introduced and adopted in 2022. As you examine the legislative platform, you will find additions on, based on council's priorities, goals, as well as state and national trends. With the nation in pandemic recovery, the city will continue to advocate for funding and resources. With greater federal and state broadband funding, the city will seek opportunities to address the digital divide at our libraries. As you see new trends in mobility, you see on many streets uh, throughout California, rentable electric bikes and scooters, the city will continue to advocate to protect our rights of way. With state funding opportunities, the city will seek resources to port, support homeless programs and services. As housing bills continue to challenge local control, the city will advocate against the elimination of single family zones, public hearings and planning standards. As e-commerce and online shopping have become the norm, the city will fight for tax equity. As new markets begin to develop for help hemp cultivation and manufacturing, the city will seek local control. Thank you, Council, for your time. I'm here to answer any of your questions and respectfully recommend adoption of the new legislative platform for the next two years. Thank you. Excellent, thank you so very much. Mina, really appreciate that. We do have one speaker via video. Do we have any questions from the dais? None? Okay, then I will call our public speaker, Jackson Piper. Good evening. Good evening, Madam Mayor, uh, members of the City Council. Um, thank you for letting me speak on this tonight. I, I'm sure that this has been put together with a lot of uh, good intention, a lot of effort from city staff. Um, but I have some very serious concerns about the emphasis on local control being maintained in this document and the lack of acknowledgement as to why local control is threatened in Thousand Oaks and in cities throughout the state, especially in regards to housing. Um, the fact is local control as exercised over the past three or four decades, especially in communities like Thousand Oaks throughout California has been synonymous with the obstruction of new housing development and has contributed directly 
to underdeveloping housing and our current crises of housing affordability and homelessness throughout the state. What I want to know is if we're going to put so much emphasis on local control in order to prevent the state from imposing its will on Thousand Oaks, how is the city of Thousand Oaks going to do better than what the state was demanding? How are you going to use your local control to deliver more housing, more affordable to the people that need it within the city? How are you going to use local control to develop the transportation and other infrastructure in a way that is more sustainable than what the state would want you to do? Are you going to be able to deliver with local control something better for the existing residents and the prospective residents, the people that grew up in Thousand Oaks and would like to stay here, the people that had to go away and would like to come back. Are you going to be able to deliver a community that is better than what the state is demanding of you if you maintain your local control? I understand the urge to want to maintain control over what happens in the community, but it should not come at the cost of a great deal of that community and its ability to maintain its life here. Please, if you are going to push for local control, understand that comes with a responsibility to do better than what the state is asking of you. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Piper is our only public speaker. I will go back to staff to um, I mean, Ms. Leba, if you could perhaps address some of the points raised. Well, I appreciate Mr. Piper's comments. The idea of local control is simply that we have elected officials. The residents here have elected a city council. That city council is in charge of land use planning. It is not the state to dictate how we develop our housing in this community. And unfortunately, Fighting local control many years ago, the state took away our very opportunity to develop affordable housing by taking away and eliminating redevelopment agencies. Now this local control we're fighting for is creating this idea that we should with along with the input through public hearings of our residents, including Mr. Piper, the ability to determine where we put our housing, where we would like to develop. What is happening right now with legislation is they're creating a punitive model. If we don't create housing, we will suffer up to $100,000 a day penalties. That type of money could actually be used and given to the city of Thousand Oaks and many other cities to develop housing. Without redevelopment agencies, cities have lost the ability of leverage funding to work with developers in creating more housing opportunities. Cities are not home builders. I'm gonna repeat that statement again because I've always come into that issue when I'm at state hearings. We are not home builders. We can create the zoning for it. It is up to developers to come to our city and say we would like to develop housing. Unfortunately, we cannot mandate the type of housing they build. They usually like to develop luxury market rate housing when we as a community are looking for workforce housing and affordable housing. And that's what we would like to be a part of the discussion and in local control, not setting aside 10% to take away our zoning opportunities just for low income housing. If we as a community are interested in developing affordable housing, we should be, have a voice to say we would like a higher threshold of affordable housing. If you as a state are going to come in and say this is how you're going to do zoning in Thousand Oaks, we would like to say this is how much we need. This is the type of housing that we need you to provide us. We also need to create a way to get back the RDA funding that we've lost. Because we as a city need to work, worry about other services and projects 
in creating a quality of life for our residents. We cannot and we are not developers. So if the state is interested in us to develop more housing, they need to come back to us and say, we're gonna set aside money for, for you, so that way we can partner with you to get to those goals, to get to those RENA goals. Mm -hmm. But to make it punitive for us, that's the local control that we need mm -hmm. and we're fighting against. Don't tell our elected officials that have been elected by the residents in Thousand Oaks how they should do their zoning. The state should not do that. We should work with our residents in partnership to develop the type of housing and zoning that is appropriate for housing. And uh, if I may, because uh, Mina, as you can um, as you can hear, has to deal with this on the front lines, and there's the, and that has to come with real passion because um, it's day after day, cycle after cycle, legislative cycle after legislative cycle. That being said, it's not just about shaking your fist in the air, and we've been very clear about that. It's uh, it's about planning locally too, and this council took the bold step of putting a general plan in place. And uh, so this council took those hard steps on a land use map uh, this year uh, over the, the first uh, seven months here. And this, um, that step, those actions are what lays that groundwork. And uh, that is what helps us to ensure that when we talk to the state, we can say we are planning locally. Just let us plan and control it locally. Thank you very much. That was extremely well stated. Uh, really, uh, I think we needed that sort of um, message and wake-up call again because, uh, I mean, we just heard how it is really in, in Sacramento and what we are dealing with. And Mina Leba, as the Legislative Affairs Analyst, knows exactly how this game is played, and it is a game, unfortunately. So um, I would like to now call on Mr. Adam. Well, thank you, Mayor, and I think we can all see the benefits of having a legislative analyst working for us, particularly Mina Leba, who knows the ins and outs of things and uh, put forth a very eloquent uh, capsulization of where we stand in relation to the state. All too often, it seems that rather than being collaborative with the state, they, they tend to have a more punitive relationship with us, which I don't think is particularly productive. And as Mr. Powers said, if you want an example of local control, we just spent 18 months questioning and polling our citizenry to put together a general plan that would be good for the next uh, 25 years that focused primarily on the issue that the state wants us to focus on, housing, but we know where to put it and we know where uh, it, uh, we know the affordable housing needs that this city has, and the state doesn't can't possibly know no. what we know. And we know that the 101 corridor seems to be the place to put this kind of housing, and uh, that that is local control, in my mind. The general plan update, perfect example of it. Wouldn't you say, Mayor? I absolutely would agree with that, and I would I also like to add to that um, just a reminder that the city of Thousand Oaks started last year with the city attorney's office writing letters to request an extension of the housing um, element deadline, and it fell on deaf ears. Earlier this year, I wrote a letter as well, and it fell on deaf ears. We, we called the league, we called SCAG, we called everybody, please help us, nothing. And what happened, uh, Ms. Leba, just about a week ago? Why don't you go ahead? What is really interesting is based on the mayor's leadership, we reached out to our partners and we sent a request for an extension. We were the only solo city to do that. Our state lobbyist even took the letters to HCD. We called SCAG, and what happened last week, we got a letter from SCAG saying, all SCAG member cities, we are asking as a coalition to send a letter to ask that SCAG be given an extension. So if they had taken the challenge when we did this in January, I think we would have more momentum, especially as now we are looking at a deadline um, in September. So I, I wanna thank you, um, Mayor, for your leadership and um, foresight and, and leading the cause. And now all of these cities are starting to join in from Southern California. But, but, but it's too late now, basically. Yeah. Well, and, <laughs> and to add to that, just for, for color, for, for other, there are a lot of cities that are 
behind the eight ball. And there are consequences, as I've said before, for not meeting those deadlines. Um, thankfully, we were lucky and we pushed through uh, and successfully moved to the next stage here. Had we not done that, and there's many, many cities that are not in that, uh, that situation, and we're still advocating for that mm -hmm. on, on their behalf, uh, right. uh, even though we have pushed through the, the most difficult and the timing piece um, for us locally. And the other thing is with new legislation that's pending, um, even if we got an extension, then the new housing laws would take place and they would be forced upon the city for yeah. the housing elements that so we'd have to make subsequent revisions. They're so moving the goalposts. They're moving the goalposts. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to, we will meet our housing element deadline. We will do it. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Engler and then Mr. Adam again. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And thank you, uh, Ms. Leba, for the very nice uh, presentation and also uh, your defense of um, our, our redevelopment agencies and that sort of thing. It, uh, it, it goes without saying that um, that is where things started to get off the rails and uh, we need that back. So um, the, the question I think I have really is, uh, and having been part of some of the discussions and, and on a couple of the committees at uh, in both National League and, and uh, uh, League of California Cities, um, I just wanna emphasize everybody that the the work that gets done um, in those committees is really helpful uh, and uh, it's very valuable for us to be part of those organizations to be able, one, to see some of the, um, I won't call them bad bills, everybody has, thinks they're a good idea when they put them in, uh, but the, the, the bills themselves um, have very dire consequences uh, for, for cities. Um, so being able to uh, have our mayor this year and uh, hopefully in, our, in the future other mayors will be able to send letters that would uh, give voice our opinion on those on those bills. But more importantly, I think, is to identify those bills which do bring uh, benefit to the city. Um, uh, the state has cut loose with quite a bit of money this year and um, being part of those leagues also helps us to identify th th those monies and be part of how to direct that back to us. So with that said, I'm, it's a defense of, of the, the leagues um, and, and your uh, efforts on it. And by the way, folks, um, being part of that, um, our, our uh, legislative administrator over here is well respected and uh, is consulted by many other cities by, besides us. Mr. Adam and then Mr. McNamee. Oh, thanks, Mayor. Yeah, I just wanted to add, I mean, local control is part of this legislative platform. And also, as uh, Mayor Pro Tem Angler mentioned, the local budget is another part. And you know, folks, there's a lot of money sloshing around out there. It's unbelievable. The feds are gonna spend six trillion. The state of California has this unexpected $100 billion uh, windfall, if you, if you may. They're gonna spend 10 billion on cities here in the state of California. And this is the uh, reason we have to have lobbyists and we have to have a legislative analyst because it's incumbent upon us, whether you agree with the spending or not, to get our fair share and have these tax dollars returned to the citizens of the city of Thousand Oaks. These are our tax dollars. Let's bring back as much as we can to our city. Absolutely, Mr. McNamee. I'd like to say thank you for your summary of why local control is important that the Sacramento's one size fit all does not work on the local level. You articulated that very well and I shall use some of your lines in future speeches. Thank you very kindly. That said, I look at things we can do to make housing more affordable. A few months ago, Wall Street Journal had a nice uh, article in there that demonstrated that 24% of housing costs is attributed to city, county, state, and federal government. And if really we wanna look as a city to help reduce housing costs and make it more affordable, we should look to see what we can do here on the local level as well as the county and state to eliminate duplicated regulations and inspections and delay times and so forth because every second that we delay in building a project, getting that developer underway to open those doors so people can move in, that drives up the cost of that project. So if you take $17,000 per year carrying costs per house, condo, apartment, townhome, times five years to construct, that's $85,000 goes into that project simply through delays, permitting, fees, inspections, and so forth. And I appreciate your fighting for uh, Thousand Oaks in Sacramento 
you articulated it very well, and I look forward to continue working with you on these issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. And with that, we, there are no other questions or speakers. Who would like to entertain a motion? Or do we, yeah, we do need one to approve. I'd like to move that uh, we accept 9B as submitted. Thank you. Madam Clerk. Councilmember Adam? Yes. Councilmember McNamee? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Engler? Yes. And Mayor Bill de la Pena? Yes. And that motion carries 4 0 with Councilmember Jones absent. Thank you. We now move to 9C, the Thousand Oaks Alliance for the Arts, Operations, and Programming update. And this will be presented by the chair of TO Arts, David Mead. And then our cultural affairs director, Jonathan Surrett, will be available for questions. Good evening. Thank you for waiting. <laughs> oh, no problem. Thank you. I'll wait till Jonathan gets situated. All right, perfect, thank you. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, I'm David Mead, I'm Chair of TO Arts, and I'm here uh, tonight to present you with our six-month uh, report and uh, for the six months ending June 30th, 2020. And tonight I plan to provide you with a brief overview of some of the highlights contained in our report. Uh, first of all, um, as I had said in uh, January, we were um, interviewing some new uh, members of the board, and I'm pleased to report that we officially welcome two new members, Kathy uh, Jeffers Volk and Kyle Rohrbach, as our newest directors. Um, also, um, TO Arts has been growing, and we've expanded programs and taken on new programs um, over the course of this pandemic. And so, as part of that, uh, Nikki Richardson, our development director, uh, they've grown, be, her duties have grown beyond development and also include arts education, administration of our DEI uh, and development task forces and our Dr. Raymond Olson grant program. And uh, we acknowledge the growth of those programs and the increased responsibility that she's undertaken. And we are proud of the work that she has done and, and accomplished for TO Arts and are grateful for her dedication uh, to our organization and the community. And so with that, I'm pleased to report that we've uh, reclassified Nikki's role and are proud to have her as the Associate Director of TU Arts now. In my previous update in January, I mentioned that we had uh, formed an ad hoc DEI uh, task force to provide recommendations to the full board on ways to integrate uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion um, more purposefully into TU Arts programs and governance as we work to fulfill our vision where the arts thrive for all. And um, at the recommendation of the task force, uh, the TO Arts Board adopted a commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. With that, um, we conducted interviews with several independent consulting practices which specialize in DEI and the board engaged the services of Equity Praxis Group of Santa Barbara to provide consulting and facilitation with TO Arts board and theater uh, leadership staff. Um, and the goal of this relationship is to provide us with a collective understanding of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and to allow TO Arts board and staff to operate from the same starting point as we seek to identify action items and goals to incorporate into our strategic plan this year. And we actually have our first session with them tomorrow. Um, so that, that should be very interesting. Um, next, uh, moving on into dollars, uh, finance. Um, TO Arts Board received and accepted the annual audit report prepared by our independent external auditors for fiscal year 2019-20. And this report reflected all of TO Arts financial activities from July 1st, 2019 to June 30th, 2020 and a copy of this audit was included in your packet. Uh, the board is currently working with staff, staff to finalize the operating budget for fiscal year 2021-2022, and we'll be discussing this item at our next meeting. Uh, the budget is expected to reflect ongoing investment in arts education programs while taking a strategic approach to presenting programs at the 
Bank of America Performing Arts Center um, now that it's on the verge of reopening. Um, next, with regard to development, we're grateful for the support of numerous businesses and individual donors who've provided financial and in-kind contributions supporting TU Arts programs and activities. Um, our programs this year would not have been possible if not for the partnership and support of the Canelo Recreation Park District, the City of Thousand Oaks, the Lakes at Thousand Oaks, Arsis Golf at Los, Ro Los Robles Greens, and many other local businesses, foundation individuals who generally, uh, generously supported our work. Um, as an annual tradition, this past February, we hosted our gratitude reception uh, virtually uh, to um, honor our donors and supporters. And it was well attended. They had different experiences in breakout rooms, including theater and music trivia, recorded performances by our grant recipients, and a virtual backstage tour of the Fred Cavley Theater. Also in uh, February, TO Arts was proud to participate in the celebration of the sector event presented virtually by the Center for Nonprofit Leadership at Cal Lutheran University. In a breakout room hosted by TO Arts, uh, Jonathan provided a virtual backstage tour of the theaters and participated in a Q&A session regarding the Bank of, Performing Art, Bank of America Performing Arts Center. Um, in June, um, our associate director, Nikki Richardson, moderated our second annual panel discussion of the state of the performing arts in the Canal Valley with representatives of local performing arts organizations to discuss how they've managed the last year and how they are focusing their efforts moving forward. Next, um, one thing we take a lot of pride in is arts education. And this year we really expanded our efforts during the pandemic to pr provide that to um, students in Canal Valley and the greater um, area. Uh, through our new Access Arts program, we joined in partnership with the Canal Schools Foundation to provide funding and support of the Focus on the Arts initiative of the Canal Valley Unified School District. This funding provided weekly Virtual, virtual arts education programs by video for all CVUSD elementary school students. Um, another exciting part of our arts education program was virtual field trips. With remote learning for all students and the theaters being closed for the last year, obviously they couldn't come here to do their annual uh, field trips and see shows. Uh, however, we were able to contract with creative partners to provide a season of virtual field trips uh, organized by our associate director. These field trips were accessible during specific durations of time uh, through our website, which made them available to students in the Canal Valley, Ventura County, and beyond. Each month, our virtual field trips were routinely accessed by five to 700 students. Uh, TO Arts was also um, able to provide new diverse experiences for students and teachers, which included programs from local art presenters like Five Star Theatricals, New West Symphony, and Dr. Corey Hill's percussive storytelling, and provided customized content uh, from presenters across the country, such as Hiplet, uh, ballerinas from Chicago, which blended, blends traditional ballet with hip hop and other styles of contemporary music. We had Mexican dance and music presented by Caladanza. We had Kakuza Fest, which is an East Coast based festival celebrating black voices and family music performances. And we had musical performances uh, by Grammy nominated recording artist Sonia de los Santos. Uh, since January, uh, TO Arts presented nine performances through our virtual National Ge Geographic Live series, our TO Arts Roadshow Drive In Concert at the Lakes and our TO Arts Scene at the Greens performances performed at the Los Robles Greens. Our intention for, out, for the outdoor events was to continue providing fun, quality, creative content in a safe environment while rebuilding the confidence and gathering together once again. Um, although the pop-up arts and music festival is produced by the city, TO Arts was proud to be the presenting sponsor of Las Cafeteras on June 25th at TO Community Park. The event was well tended and the performance was spectacular. Next, I um, want to discuss our 2021-2022 work plan. Uh, our intention is to continue expanding our arts education programs outside of the theaters to reach students in their schools. In addition to our established Kids in the Arts program, we now have new tools in our toolbox with Access Arts and virtual field trips. Uh, TO Arts will work with Equity Praxis Group and through our DEI task force to identify action items and goals relating to diversity, equity, and inclusion. 
This fall, TO Arts will again hold a strategic planning retreat to identify additional goals and objectives for the upcoming year. Now the exciting part uh, uh, is the year ahead. Um, we will be focusing on our containing, continuing engagement with the community and with our donors and sponsors. We'll also be re-engaging with audiences, patrons, and theater guests as we present events at the Bank of America Performing Arts Center. Uh, we will also, uh, TO Arts Presents will be a big focus on programming for, for the Performing Arts Center with an eye towards reinvigorating the arts, uh, culture and entertainment community, and the creative economy. There are already 46 confirmed TO Arts Presents uh, uh, for the 2021-2022 season, and we continue to add more throughout the year. Um, if you'll indulge me for a few more minutes, I know this has been long, uh, but I want to give you some idea of what's coming up here for uh, TO Arts. Uh, first of all, um, this Friday, the very first live performance uh, since the pandemic, uh, we will be having Melissa Manchester um, uh, presenting uh, in the Cavalry. Obviously, social distancing uh, and reduced audience, but we're very excited uh, uh, to have this. Um, it's a good sign uh, that uh, maybe the end of the pandemic's getting closer. Um, we also have uh, Roger McGuinn back in the Shear Forum theaters on July 16th and 17th. Uh, these were rescheduled performances from 2020 and are nearly sold out. Um, the Everly set will present an homage to the leg legendary Everly brothers in the Shear Forum on August 21st. Um, I can also tell you now that uh, publicly that Chris Isaac is scheduled to appear in the Fred Cavley Theater on September 22nd. Uh, Boz Skaggs will return to the Cavley on September 23rd, and both of these performances will go on sale this Friday. Um, Rock and Roll Hall of Famer Chris Hillman will be live here in the Shear Forum with performances on September 24th and 25th. Joining him will be Herb Peterson and John Jorgensen. Um, and then later this year, we'll be having performances by Five for Fighting, Postmodern Jukebox, and a unique concert with Mary Chapin Carpenter, Sean Colvin, and Mark Cohn, who will play together on stage in the Cavley Theater. Um, as you heard, we have 46 different uh, you know, things, so many more performances and many things that we'll be announcing in the future. And um, obviously our programming brochure is coming out in uh, early August uh, for uh, people to see and hopefully get excited about coming back to the theaters. Um, so on behalf of the TO Arts board and staff and the millions of patrons whose lives have been enriched by attending performances here, um, we'd like to thank you for your continued support uh, of our efforts and activities. And thank if you have you. any questions, Jonathan and I, and I will try to answer them. <laughs> Thank you so much. This is so exciting. The Very first nice. concert this coming Friday uh, at the Kavli. Yes. So, um, boy, it's, gosh, it's been too long. It really has been. So really, really appreciate that. And I absolutely love the addition of your DEI task force or ad hoc committee because I think the best way to understand different cultures is through music and arts and entertainment. And so with a change in programming and bringing in different music from different countries, like Las Cafeteras, for example, is just uh, really going to help perhaps ease some of the tensions that we are experiencing in not only our community, but also nationwide. So I really appreciate that. Great, thank you. We do have um, some comments or questions. We're starting with Council Member McNamee, and then Mr. Adam, and then Mayor Pro Tem Engler. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Question for you on a couple levels. The diversity, equity, and inclusion, have, is this group an outside group that you have hired as a consultant to come in and see how we can better service the needs of our community? Uh, yes, uh, Equity Praxis, they're out of Santa Barbara. It's an outside consulting firm, and um, uh, the task force, uh, you know, I, wouldn't say, I don't know if you would say went to bid, but they interviewed several different uh, groups, and, and this one came well recommended. So they're gonna help the board uh, learn how to put DEI into, into use and with regard to you know performances and inclusion for the community and, and all of those factors. So the diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, 
group that we've hired to as a consultant to help incorporate that. We've used them already. Uh, how many times, how many years have they come forth with us? I'm going to punt that to Jonathan. <laughs> sure. Councilmember McNamee. No, the equity practice group has not been contracted before. This is the first uh, time that we're getting a chance to work with them. TO Arts did, uh, as the chair was uh, mentioning, that TO Arts did conduct an informal RFP process where we reached out for uh, for quotes from several different organizations and with regard to proximity, the body of work that they have and the references, um, the, the board ultimately decided to go with Equity Praxis Group. So this is the first time we're using them. We're looking for information on how we could uh, improve our diversity, equity, and inclusion. And what type of monies are we looking to pay this consulting group to come in and do the service for us? Uh, TO Arts, uh, just to clarify, because you've used the word us, and TO Arts is a separate organization. I just want to uh, remind everybody that uh, TO Arts is an independent organization that's governed by their own board of directors. But TO Arts has contracted for, I believe, the amount of $7,500. And it's for a body of work that will take us a, a few months to achieve. So you'd think it'd be worth, worth the financial investment to put out $7,500 for the value you get back? Definitely. We'll be able to tell you for certain in a, in a few months. Super. Thank you. Mr. Adam. Thank you, Mayor. David, I want to thank you for volunteering your valuable time to promote the arts here in Thousand Oaks. We really appreciate that. And thank I'm you. very encouraged to see we have 46 performances booked already in such a short time. That's fantastic. And uh, also just it, as always, I'm so happy to see that we continue to reach out to the young people in uh, Thousand Oaks to the students. I know when I, I was probably in third or fourth grade, I remember my school sent our class to go see Peter Wolf. Uh, is that it? Peter Wolf, right? Is that right, Jonathan? Yeah. yeah. And uh, I mean, you know, it was a long time ago, and I still remember it, and it had an impact on me to this day. Here I am talking about it. So it, it does. It really has an impact on kids, and I, and I hope that we'll take a look at the DEI initiative when it comes to bringing kids to the theater, the more the better. Uh, it's really a, a positive force in their lives. So thank you for that. Great, thank you. Mayor Pratem Engler. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yes, and I, I'll just jump on the bandwagon here. I, I, uh, with the arts and everything, good, good analogy. Um, the, uh, the fact that you're going into the DEI um, aspects of things um, is very good. I appreciate that. We're oftentimes asked, what is the city doing uh, to help promote um, uh, diversity, inclusion, and, and uh, this is another aspect of what we're doing. Um, in the programming that you mentioned that brings in all cultures and, and ethnic groups, I appreciate that. I encourage you to continue that going into the future as part of this outreach on that. Um, and I, for one, am looking forward to uh, attending at least a few of those 46 uh, events coming up. Thank you for that. Great, thank you. We look forward to seeing uh, you there. Thank you, and I believe this was um, going to be a receive and file. So uh, does it need a formal vote? It, it does not. But Mr. Mead, thank you so much for your continued service, uh, volunteer service. You've done it for a number of years, and it seems to be getting better with every year. <laughs> so uh, really appreciate also the new connection and the new dimension with the Conejo Unified School District, uh, that is going to be essential because we've lost a whole generation of kids who have not really been nurtured in terms of the arts and music. And so we, we need to bring that back. And I think that this is a major step in that direction. Madam Mayor, if I can mm -hmm. jump in and just add one more point. Councilmember Adam mentioned diversity, equity, and inclusion with relation to arts education programs. Um, that is one of the true benefits of being able to operate in a virtual environment and be able to continue those programs is because it helps us further our reach with the dollars that we're setting aside uh, because those programs can be accessed really from anywhere. We're not bound by a geographic location. Uh, with regard to in-person uh, arts education programming with our established Kids in the Arts program, uh, TO Arts does routinely um, try to prioritize Title I schools uh, to be able to come to those performances as well. Our intention is to try to broaden our reach and expand uh, to reach as many students as we can. Absolutely, thank you so much. Great, thank you, have a good evening. Thank you, you too. Yep, All Mayor. right. 
That, yes. that, that's a very interesting point, so we can perhaps continue the virtual along with the real. Could yeah, we not? And yes. as you say, expand the reach? The, the intention at this point, we've learned so much in the last year, uh, especially with regard to some of the virtual components and the, the flexibility that it allows for students and teachers because they're not having to deal with you know, juggling school schedules to be able to jump on a bus, to make it here on time, to get into the theater. Um, certainly the experiential learning aspect is something that we are going to continue because that is critical to uh, developing the next generation of arts lover and participation. But with the virtual components, it gives us such a, a it gives us a wider reach and it allows us much more flexibility in how we reach those students. Mm -hmm. uh, and as I said, the geographic areas that they can participate from, th we're not bound really to just the Conejo Valley. We, with a lot of our programs that we found, we're getting students coming in from Ventura County, uh, the greater county area, as well as beyond our county. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, um, let's do both. <laughs> Good point, thank you. Yeah, I think virtual um, education is here to stay and also would like to recognize the school district for making it possible that children in Title uh, I schools, for example, they, they were supplied, um, what do you call it, laptops, so they can actually participate. So that, um, that's one way to, to in include them and um, get them engaged, so thank you. All right, and now we will go to City Manager Drew Powers for an update. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, this is our final meeting before the Council's annual summer recess, uh, and I think perhaps one of the hardest earned recesses for uh, a council in, in my 20 years in, in the business. It's been a very, very busy seven months. Um, uh, over the course of uh, the next couple of months, we'll be working on uh, another very busy agenda for this fall and putting those together. Our next council meeting will be on Tuesday, the 31st of August. Uh, wishing everyone a very uh, happy summer. Hopefully uh, folks are able to get out and enjoy some time with family and friends. Thank you, Mr. Powers. Um, also wanted to mention actually under the previous item, council issues recommendations or follow up conferences, uh, I wanted to just mention that Sergeant Ron Helis was awarded posthumously the Congressional Badge of Bravery by Congresswoman Julia Brownlee today at the Healing Garden. It was a very moving ceremony. Uh, Mayor Pro uh, Tim Engler would, would agree with that. And so um, that was uh, really something very special and wanted to, to share that with the community. Um, now we will go to the adjournment, and I have two adjournments this evening. It is with great sadness that we mourn the passing of Marine Corporal Brandon Javier Alvarez, who made the ultimate sacrifice helping to keep our nation safe. Every service member life lost is a tragedy. It is a loss to our military, to our nation, and to the families who grieve. Corporal Alvarez was 22 years old of Newberry Park. He died still mysteriously on June 6th while serving in the Middle East. The corporal was assigned fleet anti-terrorism security teams um, that was in Bahrain. Brandon joined the Marines in November of 2018 as part of his American dream. He was born on January 31st, 1999 in Thousand Oaks. He is the beloved son of Maria Cruz and one of three sons in a family of six children. Brandon was a bright young man, an incredibly hard worker with an infectious smile and had his entire life still ahead of him. He loved his country, his girlfriend, loved his family and friends and was excited about the future he was building. Tonight we honor Brandon who left us, never knowing how much he would be missed. On behalf of a thankful community, we recognize our fallen hero, Corporal Brandon Alvarez. He will never be forgotten, and it is also my fervent hope that the family will find answers as to why and how he died. 
our second adjournment is actually quite uh, fitting. We just finished speaking and discussing the state of the arts in the city of Thousand Oaks as well as in our schools. So we are adjourning tonight in memory of Michael Ganjemi, the longest tenured director at Westlake High School and one of the most beloved music educators in our school district and beyond. Mr. G, as he was known, died on June 20th at the age of 49 from complications of kidney failure. Mr. G wasn't just a music teacher. He was someone who knew how to connect with students regardless of their ability because he lived and breathed music. For many students, Ganjemi was also a mentor. Mike started playing music at age six and developed into a true and respected musician all the way to 1990 when he graduated from Westlake High School. Mr. G then toured Germany and Holland in 1990 and 1992 with USC as a member of the Pink Pop Foreign Exchange Jazz Program. In 98, Mr. G played lead trumpet for the national tour of Bye Bye Birdie. He returned to Westlake High School in 2001 to become associate band director. He later earned his degree from Southern New Hampshire University. When, at long last, he obtained his teaching credential from Cal State Northridge just two years ago, he left Westlake High School for his dream job as a band director at Santiago High School in Corona. Mike was a sought-after clinician and performer in the Southern California music scene with an impressive resume. He was associate band director at Moore Park High School, served on the board of directors for the Southern California School Band and Orchestra Association, and the California Band Directors Association. And he was actually named in 2015 New West Symphony Music Educator of the Year. Mr. G's proudest accomplishment was the formation of his own big band orchestra, the Lane 29 Orchestra. Through philanthropic activities coordinated by this group, Mr. G donated tens of thousands of dollars to charities and nonprofit organizations, including the AIDS Project LA, Juvenile Diabetes, Assistance League, and ALS. Mike's mom, Gina Zambluskas, was quoted in the ACORN as saying that teaching was Mike's true calling. That's what he loved doing most, she said, and he proved that as an educator, absolutely, undoubtedly, and with all enthusiasm and joy, he loved his students. That's the man that I raised and of whom I am so very, very proud. Westlake High School's current band director, Brian Peter, described Mike as his occupational significant other. In an email to his students announcing Mr. G's passing, Peter wrote that Mike gave endlessly to his alma mater, the students and families of Westlake High, to him, and to so many band directors around California. His sarcasm, wit, and one-liners are legendary and still make everyone laugh and shake their head. He loved music, he loved teaching, he loved helping everyone, and he loved people. And Mr. Peter says, let us all take time to remember Mr. G by listening to music he loved, Basie, Counting Crows, Gin Blossoms, and any piece he conducted or programmed for jazz would be a great start. And play your instruments, he said, even for just a short while. May the endless selfies, stories, laughs, and memories wash away any sadness. A public memorial service is planned for 4.29 p.m. 29 because of his band that he formed. 4.29 p.m. July 31st at the Westlake High School football stadium. And with that, we adjourn for the summer, and we will return at the very end of August. Please be safe, take care, have a good summer. <laughs>